two hours from Jakarta's hustle and humidity, the mountains of Punchak offer a more sedate way of life. Since colonial times, Jakarta's elite have travelled here for a relaxing getaway. But I've come looking for a very different type of visitor. Punchak is now home to hundreds of refugees and asylum seekers, waiting for their chance to come to Australia. Some have already tried. Mohibullah was only 17 when he arrived in Indonesia after fleeing Afghanistan. He boarded a boat along with 240 others bound for Ashmore Reef. After more than two weeks at sea, they were intercepted by the Australian Navy. What was the feeling on the boat when you saw the Navy ship? We were so happy. We thinking we, we get the life, yeah? We get the life. We was happy because we, uh, we think uh, the soldier is coming and already our boat was, was broken that time. The engine was broken. We make coffee. But the joy was short-lived. He says they were processed in Darwin and then towed back to Indonesian waters. Now 27 years old, he was finally recognised as a refugee by the United Nations and moved here just over a year ago. This is to certify that the above-named person has been recognised as a refugee by the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. In the photograph, you look different. Yeah, because uh, maybe, I don't know which time I give that photo. Stressed. Very stressed, maybe. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, He's not allowed to work or study, and time passes very slowly. Waiting for the pool in the United Nations office when I give the, have a call. We call and we are asking about our case, about our problem, but they say just only wait. So, so this is, um this is one, one word you've heard a lot, wait. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mohibullah says that he was recently told that he'd be settled in Australia, but the delay since then is driving him mad. My head say I want to go to try to this, like this, like this, but my body don't want to. We are sick, the, the head sick. I think maybe I am the head sick. While Mohibullah and other registered refugees wait patiently, since last year, everyone here has noticed many new arrivals. Afghans, Iraqis, and now Tamils from Sri Lanka. He says some of them don't stay long. I see, see some people, but after, after 20 days, after one month, I cannot see these dead people. I think maybe they go to buy the boat or... Yeah, tapi Arabal. I pay this local man to take me in search of the new arrivals. My guess is that he means Afghans, not Pakistanis and it's hard to differentiate the new arrivals from Saudi tourists and those refugees who've been waiting patiently for years. Jadi di di mana mana ya? Iya, di mana mana dia pada ngumpat. Sering pindah-pindah. Pindah-pindah, dia cari kontrakan, rumah kampung yang murah kan. Hmm. Tapi memang sejak uh, ini bulan-bulan terakhir ini banyak yang datang. Iya, banyak yang datang. Ya. Banyak yang baru. Iya, ganti yang baru. This is the route the people smugglers use to bring their human cargo to the coast before they board a boat to Australia. Last month, a group of recent arrivals from Afghanistan made this journey down the mountain from Punchak. In an hour and a half, they would have passed through the capital, Jakarta, and then continued a couple of hours more to the west coast of Java. This would have to be one of the busiest highways anywhere in the world. 
It's the main road through Java and onto Sumatra. And amongst all of this, it's pretty easy for a busload of would-be asylum seekers to blend in. Turning off the highway towards the coastal resort town of Anya would not have raised any eyebrows either. It's a popular spot for holidaymakers. They probably wouldn't have stopped to take a look at Anak Krakatau volcano, which has been erupting lately. Eventually arriving in Anya, they turned into the Villa Trimurti. The district police chief has brought me here to help piece it all together. Kosasi says police throughout this region had been keeping an eye out for asylum seekers for the previous two weeks, following a tip-off from the Australian Federal Police. It was a call from suspicious staff at the Villa Trimurti that led to the arrest of the 70 Afghans on April 17th. Mereka datang lewat pintu sini dan mereka berkumpul di sini. They were shown to their rooms and then the staff helped them organize the bedding. Five to six people per room. Jadi ini tempat mereka gelar tikar. Jadi pakai tikar tidur di sini juga sama karena enggak muat posisi di kamar. But by the following day, staff had become suspicious of the holiday makers who didn't seem to kick back and relax. Kalau tamu dari yang lain, ini bisa dibuka. Ya, karena itu pemandangan ya. Iya. Pemandangan. Iya, lihat pemandangan, tapi mereka enggak buka. Selalu tertutup. Jadi pemandangan ini enggak tertarik sama mereka. Mereka mungkin tertarik, tapi mereka enggak mau lihat itu. The police tell me that the entire villa had been booked by a people smuggler called Haji Ali. Bapak tahu kalau ada dia punya alias atau Ali Hadad. Hadad. Hadad alias Boston. Itu Ali bahasa Indonesia lancar sekali. Lancar. Sangat, sangat the staff tell me that once Ali had his clients locked in at the villa, he drove off with three Indonesians who were helping him. Apparently, they went to repair the boat. And this is the hulk that would have transported the 70 people to Australia. Like most of the fishing boats that smugglers buy for the voyage, the Mutiara 3 is barely seaworthy. At the dry dock, security guard Shiafwi was told the boat was heading for Sumatra, but started leaking and had to turn back for some quick repairs. The crack went all along the length of the hull, and the boat will now be used as evidence by the Indonesian police. Although after all these years, people smuggling is still not a crime in Indonesia. While I'm filming, the Australian Federal Police arrive. She's just walked behind. She's just walked behind the car. Their people smuggling disruption activities in Indonesia are shrouded in secrecy, so they wouldn't have been happy to see me here. As dusk falls, I leave them to do their work photographing the mutiara for their files. While the people smuggler Haji Ali was away organizing the transport, the police arrived at the Villa Trimurti to check on the strange holiday makers. Uh, jadi mereka begitu melihat patroli, mobil patroli di depan gerbang, mereka takut. Uh, sehingga pada saat itu ada dua, dua orang uh, loncat dari jendela. Others ran away or hid in the ceiling space. They were all eventually rounded up. The police then tried to lure the smuggler back. Di telepon pada saat itu, uh, oke, okay, saya kembali ke villa. Nanti saya datang. Uh, itu mereka uh, tanggung jawab saya seperti begitu. Jadi ditunggu sama Pak Kapolsek di sini uh, dengan tim polisi menunggu di sini, menunggu Ali datang sampai malam. Ali tidak kunjung datang. The police say they are searching for Haji Ali, although what they'll do if they catch him remains unclear. 
Technically, he's done nothing wrong under Indonesian law. Bisa dia masih di Banten atau kira-kira di mana sekarang udah bisa di mana-mana ya? Nah, kamu informasi karena ini ada keterlibatan dari perempuan orang Indonesia, mungkin dia bisa di mana-mana. Crucially though for Australia, the Indonesian police managed to stop the boat leaving. Relations between the Indonesian and Australian police, at least here in West Java, seem excellent. At the police headquarters, I meet the deputy commander. Ya, kita tetap koordinasi dengan polisi federal Australia. Koordinasi karena dari polisi itu kita coba informasi uh, dari mereka kita, kita kita analisa, kita kembangkan di lapangan. Tetap koordinasi dengan polisi Amerika, eh, polisi Australia dengan pihak Yom dan dari pihak imigrasi. Jadi sering ada informasi dat masuk dari pihak polisi Australia. Sering. Kemarin juga kami koordinasi dengan polisi Australia sebelum kami menangkap para imigran ini. Kira-kira ada berapa orang yang lagi menunggu-nunggu uh, nyebrang ke Australia Ma. di sekitar sini? Mungkin ada di luar, mungkin ribuan. Tapi kita nggak tahu. Yang kita Legon kemarin kita aman 70 orang. Kita amankan, masuk melalui wilayah Anyer. Menggunakan kapal KM Mutiara. This is central Jakarta. Like Puncak, it's another place that asylum seekers congregate. The area used to be full of Western backpackers. Now it's mostly Iraqis and Afghans. They meet up at McDonald's and stay in cheap hotels and boarding houses around here. Late one night, I meet a young man from Ghazni, Afghanistan, who calls himself Habib. He's been in Jakarta for just one month. He doesn't want to be filmed, so I pick him up and we go for a drive. He fears his people smuggler has stolen all his money and disappeared. It doesn't sound good. It, uh, when was this? The first day? Yeah, the first day when we come to here. Habib is now stuck in this sprawling metropolis. He wants to find the smuggler, but he doesn't know how. This. So how much money did he take from you? Around six thousand dollars. So he, he, you paid six thousand dollars for what? To get to where? To Indonesia? Or was that so no, no. to get to Just Australia? Just I gave him maybe to another country. Mm. To Australia? Yes, maybe Australia. Mm. Yeah. And he promised he could do that? Yeah. The asylum seekers stay in this area because it's close to this building, which houses the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, or UNHCR. I wanted to talk to them, but the issue is so sensitive, they refer me to their Canberra office. Regional representative Richard Toll would not answer questions about specific people. He did say, however, that 80 of the 600 cases they have in Indonesia have been confirmed for resettlement since last year. Australia agreed to take 35 of those. Uh, Canada about 22, and I think New Zealand around the same number. So, uh, and a very small number went to went to Europe. I mean, globally, just to put this uh, globally, we've got about 500,000 people who need resettlement outcomes because they can't stay where they are in refugee camps, and roughly 100,000 places a year. So there is a major deficit. And this, in some ways, explains the level of frustration and some reasons why people decide to keep moving because they're not able to find solutions locally. Despite boats continuing to arrive in Australia, relations with Indonesia are the best they've been in years. Kevin Rudd and Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono have even agreed on an important extradition exchange. The Indonesians want Adrian Kiki Ariawan, featured here on Indonesia's Tempo magazine website. He's a corrupt Jakarta banker who embezzled hundreds of millions of dollars and is currently detained in Perth. 
The Australians want Hadi Ahmadi, a dual Iraqi Iranian, for people smuggling offences allegedly committed between 1999 and 2001. He'll be the first alleged smuggler ever extradited to Australia from Indonesia. In the meantime, Ahmadi has been sitting in police detention for 10 months without charge. Uh, this is extradition case, whether he, he, he should be extradited or not. His lawyer, Joel Tanos, says it's an outrageous miscarriage of justice, all in the name of improving bilateral relations. I'll give uh, the phone to him, all right? Okay. okay. Hello, Hadi, how are you? As I was talking with him, and before I knew what was happening, um, he had Ahmadi on the line from his prison cell. They said that I uh, did smuggling people on, on 2000 and 2001. So how they can meet me on 2003, I never can do that thing. They just like, um, they just killing me. So, so, so I, I'm 10 months already for nothing here. Why would the Australian government waste so much time and energy chasing you if you didn't do something to help facilitate the people smuggling trade? I'm also not sure because uh, uh, last year, because I was here on 2007 in the immigration office, the police federal came to me, he offered me some work. He asked me to do something. I said, I can do it. He gave me last chance. He said, if you uh, want to help us, we can help you. We can work together. I said, that's a dangerous thing. I don't want to do it. Mm. He said, OK, so you will be in big hole. You can go out. So I if it's true, Ahmadi's claim that the Australian Federal Police asked him to spy for them it would appear to shed more light on the secretive people smuggling disruption program. I would like to give you, i show you a letter from is an AFP police officer who came to see Hadi, who approached Hadi for quote and unquote cooperation, offering him a job actually. Yeah. In return for the job, Hadi Ahmadi would get, according to him, citizenship, money, and other enjoyments. Hadi, you have the chance to change your life. If you don't take it, I wish you luck in future. Regards. What did Hadi Ahmadi tell you the Australian Federal Police offered him? I don't know uh, what AF he wanted to, to know or to get from him, but that was an offer offering citizenship, offering money, offering yeah, that job. So giving him uh, uh, enjoyment, life enjoyment, yeah, I think. In return, Hadi Ahmadi had to work for, for them. In return, Hadi Ahmadi had to inform them everything. But about in, the activities of about other About the activities uh, of sparklers. Mm -hmm. And Hadi Ahmadi rejected this, yeah. He said, no, because I didn't want to betray Indonesia. Uh, I don't know what is going on. So someone is looking uh, for some uh, point. They are just using me. Mm. A lot of people are working now, many, many smugglers, really smugglers. They are working now. They are sending a ship to Australia always. They are sending every month. They are sending. Nobody touched them. They are free in Jakarta, you know, many smuggler people are free in Jakarta now, they are working. Mm. Nobody touched them, even the police uh, arrest them, they pay money and got free. Why do you think uh, nobody is, is getting them and they're concentrating on you? Because they have money, they can pay. When they arrest me, I have nothing, I, I don't have money, I have nothing to uh, uh, support myself. This document, obtained by Dateline from the South Jakarta court, outlines the public prosecutor's case for the extradition of Hadi Ahmadi. According to the document, he has nine aliases. Ahmadi's lawyer says he has no aliases and he'll fight his client's detention and extradition. Say, uh, Australia has the law, people smuggling law, so that means it is a crime. Indonesia has no that law. 
in fact, Indonesia doesn't have that law. The extradition cannot happen. So Hadi Ahmadi cannot be extradited. No, should not be extradited because we don't have that law. Only one country has. Yeah. So if uh, they do send, it's against the law. So, so you're saying that the president uh, would be breaking his own laws by That's agreeing right. to this extradition? That's right. That's right. So if you had the chance, if you had the opportunity to speak to the Australian Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, what would you say to him? I just, I just want to tell him that uh, please, you do your best to uh, get success when you're on, the, on, on your uh, job, but please don't use me. But, uh, I'm a very small person. I'm nothing. But he calls people smugglers the scum of the earth. So he, you, you have a bit of a problem with him at the moment. I'm sure that he has uh, wrong information about me. They just make me big. But I'm nothing. They just make me big. Mm. Yeah, please, 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 I need, I beg everyone who can help me. Mr. Prime Minister or Mr. Ambassador here, I'm tired from this condition. Maybe just a few months, I will kill myself also. I don't know what's, what's going on with me. Mm. I'm really tired, really tired. Did you, you didn't say you will kill yourself, did you? Sometimes I will do it. No, no, you don't do that. You, I'm really tired. No, you, you have to, uh, you have to, um, you know, wait, wait for the opportunity to explain your situation. I mean, you don't want to be talking about suicide. Forget all that. I'm really in bad condition, very difficult situation I'm living now. Back in Punchak, Mohibullah too is hoping his difficult situation will soon come to an end. If, as he says, the authorities have decided on his case, then sometime in the future he will be coming to Australia, but not in a leaky boat. <laughs>